shotguns are singing A pointing dog down in the old logging road And Danny got three And looked back a grinning I fumbled around and I tried to reload The country was... Welcome to Clays and Birds. I'm your host, Andrew Schatz, and this is where we take you from the range to the field. Uh, all right, so a couple of things. Uh, had a great weekend, a lot of shooting this weekend. Uh, I will uh, fill you in on those details. Um, we're actually also going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be doing uh, British Made Guns. Greg Elliott's coming back on. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all that fun stuff with those crazy high-end guns we all occasionally see and say, who the hell buys those? Uh, we're going to delve into that and talk about why they're worth what they're worth, uh, what you should be buying, what you should be looking for, uh, all that fun stuff. So, uh, and then after that, I got, um, Jonathan Carney, uh, VP of sales from La Florida Minicana Cigars coming on. Uh, so, uh, new segment of, uh, Tobacconist Corner finally been putting it off, uh, but got him on the phone finally. Uh, we got that set up. So we're going to get into that later too. Uh, so on to my week and, and what's been going on. Uh, I first want to give out, uh, give a shout out to, uh, Australia. I don't know what the hell is going on over there, but, uh, my downloads from Australia are off the charts this past, uh, week, past four or five days. Um, so <laughs> whatever's going on over there, I noticed, I appreciate it. I enjoy the love. Uh, and, uh, now I'm trying to find somebody from Australia to come on the program. <laughs> so uh, bear with me, but, uh, thank you, uh, Australia. Um, so moving on from that, I had an awesome experience, uh, this weekend. I, um, I had gotten a message. I'd been in contact with a younger guy, my age, actually 28, um, from Massachusetts who is uh, duck hunter getting into, into bird hunting in general. And, uh, he te- texted me and said, Hey, we're going down to Addyville in, uh, Mapleville, Rhode Island, uh, where they got a sporting clays course, uh, Robin Hall Outfitters, who I talk about a ton is there. Uh, so anyways, they, they said, we're going to go shoot sporting clays. You want to come? So I, uh, said, what the hell? Like, you know, uh, nice to meet new people and, you know, you're downloading and listening to my podcast and speak highly of it. So who am I to reject you? Uh, let's go. So I, uh, I made the trip down, uh, about an hour and a half drive for me. And, uh, I met up and it's an intimidating experience because apparently, you know, there are five of them and it's one of me and, uh, I'm laughing like, you know, is this going to be, uh, a bunch of people I would never want to talk to? Uh, are they all crazy? Uh, <laughs> where does it fit in? It's kind of this weird, weird thing now that I, I guess there's some sort of, uh, since my social media presence doing this podcast, uh, the people reach out to you more and talk to you more and engage you more. And I've always been kind of an isolationist person as odd as that seems, uh, doing this podcast. But, um, you know, I've always been comfortable speaking with people and, and having an interaction, but actively going out and being like, yeah, let's make friends has never been my, uh, forte. So I went down and, you know, I was ex- prepared for the worst, hoping for the best. Uh, and I, I turned out to be extremely lucky. Um, the five awesome guys down there and, uh, we, we had fun, uh, shooting at Addyville, uh, sporting clays. Uh, we, we were laughing. I, I brought the 28 gauge and they're all shooting 12. Uh, and I was like, you know, I may suck with this, so <laughs> bear with me, but you know, I held my own, uh, shooting a sub gauge and, um, I mean, we had a fun time. Uh, we shot for a couple hours, uh, cracking jokes. Uh, it couldn't have been nicer people. Like I said, it was an awesome time. Uh, the Sega 12 gauge uh, made an appearance, uh, uh, which was I think it was I can't remember what gun it was. I think it was, but uh, anyways, we had a, we had basically the AK platform of a 12 gauge uh, that came out, which I'm sure Addyville has never seen before on the sporting clays course. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, I'm not very good with it. Um, so anyways, it was a good time. It was a good time. And then to to contrast that, I had the antithesis of that experience. I went to Minuteman on Sunday, uh, when I wasn't feeling too hot actually. And, um, I met up with Greg who's coming on later from dogs and doubles. Uh, and we shot, um, some British made shotguns and gave me a little history lesson. It was interesting. And, uh, you know, I couldn't have picked two more opposite experiences, but both were, were just fucking awesome. Um, so I had a lot of, a lot of fun with that. Um, <laughs> anyways, so I, I, you know, shout out to the, uh, the listeners out there who, uh, in, invite me to go shooting. Uh, I will 
rarely turn it down. Um, but I didn't get murdered. I didn't get raped. Uh, nothing bad happened. Uh, it was all an enjoyable experience. So I, I can't, uh, can't complain. Uh, so I'm trying to think of, uh, what else we want to get into here. Um, on, uh, another front next week, I know, uh, the Southern side by sides going on. I'm going to try to have, uh, some coverage of that going on. Uh, people come on or whatever, uh, and talk about it. Um, so anyways, yeah, that, that's the, uh, that's the big thing for next week too. So this week, uh, also we had a, a viewer question. I want to ask you something and you're going to say, oh, it's too soon. I don't really know him well enough. We only been out a couple times. All right. So this week's, uh, uh, viewer, listener question, viewer, listener. I don't know which one, uh, question comes from Eric. Uh, Eric sent me an email, basically, you know, gist of it was, uh, always been into the dog side of hunting, never really the, the bird killing shotgun side, uh, so to speak. He's been looking at getting shotguns. Um, he's always shot a Mossberg 500, but he wants to up what he's getting or what he has now. Uh, he says he's been looking at the CZs, uh, any experience, any opinion on CZ and which one would you recommend? So, well, with that being said, uh, I'll start off with this. The, the CZs, they're people, purists will give you crap about a CZ. Uh, you know, they're they're machined and they're not, you know, hand fit in the same way and, and yada, yada, yada. And there's validity to that statement. You're not going to hear me tell you there isn't truth to what they're saying. Um, but for most people that don't really give a shit, and there are plenty of people out there and it's nothing against them. It's just the way they are. They don't really care who makes the gun, what it looks like. They just want a decent gun that shoots well. Um, now most of the CZs like, uh, the redhead premiere is the one I'm, I'm going to tell you that if you're going to get a CZ is the one I would get personally, uh, just cause they've had it around forever. It's been in the line for a long time. And to me, it's, it is the, it's the flagship gun of CZ shotguns. Uh, so that's at a thousand bucks. Now, if you were to stretch your budget to say fifteen hundred, um, I would be recommending a Beretta Silver Pigeon. Um, I was having this conversation this past weekend with the guys down in uh, at Addyville. Uh, to me, bang for the buck, I don't think there's a better over and under uh, shotgun than the Silver Pigeon uh, one. I just think the price point on a used one you can find around fifteen, sixteen hundred bucks. Uh, that is a hard price point to beat on a really nice gun. So that being said. Uh, I would, um, I would say if you are going to go the CZ route and I understand if you don't want to stretch the budget, I mean, basically I'm saying take 50% of your predetermined budget, uh, extra and, you know, adding it on there. So, uh, it's a significant upgrade to go from the thousand to 1500. If your budget really is a thousand, like that's a big jump. Um, so if you're going to stay at that thousand price range, 900,000 bucks, uh, I would say the CZ, uh, the redhead, um, premier, uh, would be my personal choice. Um, now we can get into the debate about, uh, what gauge you want to shoot and all that. Uh, I, I'm always, I'm, <laughs> I'm a sub gauge guy. Like it's no secret around here, but the reality is it's more expensive to shoot the sub gauges, uh, and it's harder to shoot. So they make it, uh, in, I think it comes in everything. 12, 20, uh, 12, 20, 28 and 410. I think you can get in any of them. I'm going to say the, the 20 gauge, if I were just strictly bird, we're not really talking maybe occasional sporting quays or whatever, but I'm not shooting trap. I'm not shooting any of that. Just really a bird gun. The 20 gauge is what you should be using. Um, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, unless we're talking duck hunting, then that's a whole nother conversation. But anyways, uh, assuming we're talking about over and under, <laughs> uh, uh, upland game gun, uh, the 20 gauge with the 28 inch barrels from CZ, uh, for the 900 bucks new, uh, it is a hard, hard value to beat for 900 bucks. Um, I just, I think that's incredibly well priced for what you're getting. Uh, the gun, you know, it's, it's length of pull is like 14 inches or so. Um, it weighs just shy of seven pounds. So it's got some meat to it. It's not super light and whippy, uh, but it's not going to kill you all day carrying in the field. Uh, th that's just to me, if you're going to go that route, um, uh, go that way. So. All right, moving on from that, now that I've covered that uh, listener question, which I love these questions. The more you guys send me, uh, the happier I'll be, uh, so please don't hesitate. I'm always open for more questions. Um, so anyways, moving on from that, I want to welcome on Greg. 
Uh, so let, let's do that. Let's do the interview with Greg and uh, talk about British guns. <laughs> the antithesis of CZ, who we'll jump into the the uh, the boss and uh, high end guns. <laughs> Joining us again for the second time, my first two-time guest, uh, Greg Elliott. Uh, how are you today, Greg? I'm doing great, Andrew. How you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. It's been a it's been a long twelve hours since I last saw you, or whatever we're at right now. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, right. That was fun shooting yesterday. Yeah, it was a great time. A great time to see your Krieg off. So, yeah, you surprisingly shot it better than uh, I think you expected and I expected. Uh, I, I was I was impressed that how quickly you adjusted to a 28 gauge. Uh, I, I'm I'm hoping that suddenly now you have a slight desire for a sub gauge gun. <laughs> I don't think I shot it any better than I shot my 12 though. That that so. may be true, but I think it costs less than maybe some of your 12s. But <laughs> <laughs> so so yesterday. Well, the thing that was the thing that was strange is the stock dimensions were kind of all over the place. Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, not to get sidetracked, but this gets into one of my this gets into one of my my uh, my other rants about stock fitting and how I, I I think it might be a little overrated. But anyway, that's that's a topic for another time. So <laughs> all right, fair fair enough. Uh, and we also had the Merkels out there too, uh, which that sixteen yeah, gauge Merkel was a lot of fun. Uh, but you know, today I really want to talk about British guns because this is a subject that's still new to me. Uh, you know, I know a lot of the German stuff. I know a little bit about the British. A little bit. Of the, I know a little bit about a lot, but I don't know a lot about certain countries of origin. And and the UK, mm -hmm. the UK in particular, uh, and I don't want to just limit it to England because I think it's the UK in general. It seems like another world of shotguns to anybody from the outside, um, mostly from like the price point and just it seems like a different world, different time. Uh, and everyone I know that's heavy into them, usually they're really knowledgeable people. I don't find a lot of people who are dumb about guns, quote unquote, uh, collecting and buying British guns. So. I guess, right. I guess my first question is like, what are the major brands? Like, I know Holland and Holland and Purdy and those, but what are the in your mind? What are the major UK British gun companies out there? Uh, so I would say, let's see. So we'll start in Scotland. I would say the major ones are uh, John Dixon, which is uh, in Edinburgh. Yep. Um, they're they're still around. They're still making guns. Um, so so we move south into Birmingham. Wesley Richards is still around. Um, you know, they've been around for a couple hundred years, uh, at least. Um, w and C Scott, uh, they're, they're another huge major manufacturer. They went out of business, I like in like the seventies or so Holland bought them and they continued them on for a little while, but they were probably the world's biggest gun maker or the biggest, they were definitely the biggest gun maker, uh, in the UK sporting arms maker. Um, and they were huge. They made a lot of guns for a lot of companies and, uh, in the late, 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, Greener is also another Birmingham. W.W. W. Greener is another Birmingham maker. Uh, they were another huge maker. Um, they're still around as sort of a boutique maker, and they make a few guns each year under their name. Yep. Um, and then down to London, so the big three in London are Holland and Holland, Purdy, James Purdy and Son, and Boston Company. Those are the traditional big three. Um, then you have James Woodward and Son. And then there's a bunch of other London makers. But if you were to say the most famous makers are, uh, you know, Purdy, Holland and Holland, Boss and Woodward. OK, um, now I have a question for you because this uh, you kind of touched on it slightly, but unintentionally. A lot of these companies, you know, you see these big price tags and you ask yourself, uh, how many of these can they be selling? And you talked about one company uh, in particular only sells, you know, a handful a year or a few a year, so to speak. How do they actually make a living mm -hmm. doing that? Selling, I don't know what a few in your mind is, uh, but how do they how do they survive selling so few guns a year? They charge an awful lot for them. <laughs> you know, that's why they cost one hundred and forty thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's why those that's why those things the price tags on them are so astronomical. So um, are they? And I don't think anybody's making. I don't think any of those. The actual guys making those things, none of those guys are getting rich, you know? So, yeah, so is this... Not a, not a profession to go into if you want to get wealthy. Yeah, so is this like three or four guys working on gun, uh, with two gun maker, a four or five person company making, you know, 10 guns a year? Is that really how it works out? 
Yeah, I mean, well, some of the there's some boutique makers that are just a couple guys that are basically uh, um, they usually have a specialty. Like one of them will be an actioner, one might be a stalker. And then there's a lot of work, and this is throughout the British trade. There's a lot of work that gets done by sort of a, a freelance staff of gun makers. So oh. there's guys who are barrel makers, yep. and they make barrels for they make barrels for different makers, you know. And there's lock makers exist, and that that's pretty common. So you like these little small boutique shops. A lot of them will have a couple guys that may be full time for them, but then they're they're shopping out a lot of the other parts of the guns just because uh, each aspect of building a gun is a very specialized skill. Um, and this in the trade, in a lot of ways, has always been that way. There's always been a lot of outworkers, yeah. And um, you know that's still the case today. So. so now, what what would you say is the price range? If someone was like, I want to go out and buy a British-made shotgun, we're not even saying side-by-side side or over-under. We won't even specify it to that degree. What is the price range from the low end to the high end used market we're talking about? Can you find stuff that's British-made British, so, British made that's at least somewhat quality? I mean, you know, I, there's only so much expectation in the $1,000 range, or is it really you can't get, get in until uh, you hit three, really. three grand? You still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I got you. You were breaking up for a second. Um, I think so. It, so there's a lot of there's a lot of different stuff in British guns. So there's box locks, there's side locks, um, there's round actions. Um, so there's there's a, there's a tremendous variety, and within each one of those styles of guns, there's a lot of grades. There's a lot of quality grades. So you can get a really, you know, a, a well made solid British box lock non-ejector you can buy those for fifteen hundred two thousand dollars you know yeah um and they're good solid they're good solid shooting guns they tend to in a 12 gauge they'll weigh six and a half six and three quarter pounds um they handle really well they're really dynamic and they're they're nice guns and then pretty much from there it's you know how it just keeps going up you know you can get you can buy a really nice british box lock ejector for three thousand dollars um they go up. They usually they, they go up to about six or seven thousand. We're talking all twelve gauges here. Yep. Um, decent side locks. You can start getting into decent side locks for about eight grand, um, and then those run up. You know, this is all used stuff. Uh, you can get you know really you can get a really nice side lock. You know, from a, from a known maker, you can buy those for twelve to fifteen thousand. Okay. Um, and then when you get into the big names, like if you get into your purdies and stuff like that, you're talking, you know, decent ones. You're talking twenty thousand plus for the most part. Okay. So, and now, those are side by sides. Now here's a uh, here's a question for you. So I, I'm, you know, I had to research it myself back in the day. But will you explain the difference in box lock uh, and you know, and each of the different systems? Yeah. So let's see a quick explanation of that. So a box lock is uh so those are the side by sides that you know basically the actions kind of look like little boxes and the action is the part where that has the hammers in it the barrels attached to it and the stock comes into it from behind um and the triggers are right behind it so that's the action and on a box lock the hammers you know the hammers that fall to strike the uh the primers the hammers are attached to the inside um of the box of the action um, and so they're, they're, they're actually affixed to it. And to access those, if you had to work on them, there's a plate on the bottom of the gun, you remove the plate and then you see the, uh, you see the, uh, hammers in there and on side lock, the locks, the, the lock work. So the hammers and all the associated components are on those plates that run down the sides of the action. So they're on the sides of the action and they're more behind the, uh, they're further behind the, the, um, what you call the fences on the shotgun, which are those bulges at the end of the barrel. So basically the biggest difference in them is side locks take more time to build. They're more complex. Um, it's arguable, you know, whether or not they're better, but yeah. they, uh, they tend to look a little nicer. They tend to be a little slimmer. Um, I think they're a little more elegant looking gun. And like I said, they definitely take more time to build. Um, and they are traditionally, uh, a side lock is what's considered uh, what's called a best gun. So, you know, like the traditionally the, the, the most, you know, the most top of the line guns coming out of the English trade were 
side locks. You know, that's not Greener made box locks that they considered to be um, best guns, but basically side locks were always considered to be the best. So. Okay, and uh, I'll throw one in there. Uh, drop lock. So a drop lock is just a. Uh, uh, so it's a Wesley Richards invention. Yep. So all a drop lock is is a box lock that. How do you explain this? They basically built an, another. So if you imagine on a box lock, there's a wall on either side that the hammers are fixed to. Okay. Okay. And what what a Wesley Richards drop lock did is they put a piece of metal in there. They basically put a plate in and they affixed the lock work to the plate. Uh, and the plate goes is flushes against the side of the action of the box. So basically you can pull the locks out. They drop out. So it's kind of a clever, um, they're kind, it's kind of a clever little feature of the guns. Um, the reason they came up with it was because they were trying to get a way to uh, clean up the sides of the actions of the gun um, so that the engraving would look better on the guns. Because when you have the hammers, on a regular box lock, there's little uh, screws and stuff. That the, the, whole, the heads of them come through the action because they're pivot points and stuff. Yep. And they wanted to get rid of those. And then once they, once they came up with this system where they could kind of drop the locks out and stuff, they were like, hey, we could, you know, this could have, may have some practical applications. And so that's where that all came from. And it's, they're pretty cool. They're, you know, drop locks are cool guns, um, but they're not that much different than a regular box lock. Do you, see them, do you see them a lot or is it really just a Wesley Richards thing? Like, does anybody else really uh, so, dabble in it? So they, uh, some, a couple German companies, I think Merkel yeah. made some, uh, and uh, some Italian companies made some. Abby Abaco and Salvinelli, I think they're called the Tribute Series. They made a few of them, but no one else, you know, those were the German guns. There, was, there weren't that many of those, and there weren't that many of the Italian guns. It's pretty much, the drop lock is pretty much a signature Wesley Richards feature. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was looking up online. I, I guess you can get a four gauge Wesley Richard drop lock uh new from the factory or you know, factory is a stretch. <laughs> new from the yeah, guy the guy's yeah, the guy's yeah. basement. <laughs> um so uh anyways, I, I just, just found, what you need. Yeah, for the mere price of seventy five thousand British pounds. Uh <laughs> just, just sign me up. Yeah, yeah. Um so Yeah, those those new Wesley Richards are nice. They're nice guns though. The, the drop locks there. They call them hand attached locks, but they're nice guns. Yeah, for fifty thousand British pounds for a twelve gauge, I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, I hope it's, yeah. I hope it's a nice gun. Um, okay, so yeah. now most people would would balk at the price tag of these guns, right? Your average person who's shooting, you know, a Browning or a Parker or or, or some of these other guns uh, would would say you have lost your fucking mind if you're dropping. 12, 20, 50, 75, 100 plus thousand dollars on a shotgun. Uh, do you have any, like a, a counter to that? Do you have a, a different opinion uh, that you could express verbally? Well, I think there's, I think there's a tremendous amount of quality. I mean, and in, in I, you and I were talking about this yesterday. I think there's a, there's a lot of quality in these guns. And there's, once you learn to, you know, once people point these things out to you and you play with them a lot and stuff like that, there's a lot of little things about them that when the really, really good ones, you once you see that quality and you appreciate it, there's only one way to get it, and that's to get the really good stuff, you know? Yeah, watch, um, watch Whether it. or not any of that has anything to do with the, the actual shootable, uh, you know, quality of... Am, am I, are you going to hit more with it? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> but if, if you appreciate it and, you know, you... Uh, you like how it looks, you know. I, I think that those the, the really, the really nice British stuff just looks fantastic, and that's a lot of what I like about it. Um, yeah, well, it, and then it's just it's just quality. So. I noticed, you know, when we were shooting yesterday uh, down at Mass, you really when you pick up a gun, you go through everything on it. Even when you were looking at a brand new Krigoff, you were playing with the safety. You were, I mean, you you dissect every gun as far down as you can without taking it apart on the spot, right? That's that's a pretty fair assessment of how you, I mean, you, when someone, yeah, yeah. If, if you're, someone's around you, well, think, it's hard to miss how in depth and how much you care about those little things. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff. Like once you, once you get into these things, those are all the little things. Like as soon as you pick something up, you start, you start fiddling with it. Cause all of those little things are uh, really good indications of, of quality and what went in to build it and the tolerances that went in to build it. 
and how precisely everything's fitted. And all of those little uh, nuances, um, it's not just, it's quality, it's also uh, longevity of the guns. The better pieces are fitted, um, the better everything comes together, the better everything wears too. Um, and I think, you know, just the proof that if you look at the number of, there are all sorts of hundred year old British guns out there that are still going strong. You, you know, people are using them to this day and that's a testament to how well they were built. And uh, the fact that, you know, you can also repair them easily and, and keep them going. So, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it's the British guns. I have an appreciation for to a certain extent. And, you know, there are a lot of things about them that I find appealing. I think visually, uh, if you want to talk about uh, what'd you call it, it the porn standard, where it's good porn when you see it and you know it, uh, <laughs> when, when, and that's how it is the right. shotguns. Because we were having this debate, and you know, uh, for me, uh, just from my own shooting, German stuff has lasted me longer than anything else. And to me, I put a high value on the uh, amount of abuse and longevity a gun can take, right? And I noticed with mm-hmm. you is a lot more of the mechanical workings. Uh, the quality of wood on it, uh, the fit and finish of the gun, I guess is the way I would describe a lot of the things that you like. Uh, you can t- tell me if I'm wrong about that, but I feel like fit and finish is a big, no, thing, that's true. A big that's thing true. to um, you. Know, when we were, when I was shooting some of your guns yesterday, and you know, you pick them up, and it is a work of art. I mean, the wood on them is top of the not line. The, the, the case color hardening, they didn't spare any expense. Like a lot of these details, right? So, I mean... It, yeah. Is there any other country in your mind that even comes close to what the UK has put out shotgun quality wise on fit and finish? Or do you think they set the bar and everyone else is just behind them? So I think as far as, uh, so if you were to talk about up until, so the best British stuff was made in my, you know, is basically made from, well, up until world war two, but, um, The best British stuff, I don't think there's, you know, there's really good German stuff out there. There's really good French stuff. There's really good Belgian stuff. Um, And I think that stuff comes really close to the top English stuff. But I think, you know, like, um, you know, Holland and Holland Royal from the 30s is a really tough gun to beat. You know, those are just, they're beautifully made, um, fantastic quality. And I think you'd have a really hard time finding uh, you know, something Belgian or German or French to beat that. You might, you know, you could come, I think you could come really close, but um, I think for the most part, you know, the British stuff from that period, the early British stuff is as good as it gets. I don't know that that's, you know, that today there's, you know, there's definitely some makers out there. Hartman and Weiss, they're, they're in Germany, you know, yeah. they make fantastic stuff. I would put them up, you know, they're definitely one of the top three. Um, you know, I know that, uh, there's some hard Granger in France is supposed to make really nice guns. I've never seen one of their guns in the flesh. Um, there aren't any really Belgian makers around anymore. Yeah. Um, and Spanish stuff, uh, some Spanish stuff is good, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't hit the same level. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'm not a big fan of the Italian stuff. So I know, I know people think I'm an idiot for saying that, uh, the Fratelli Rosinis and those types of guns, they don't do anything for me. Although people who are much more knowledgeable than I am and have a lot more stuff than I do swear those Fratelli Rosini side-by-sides are the greatest guns in the world. I just don't. They don't do anything for me. The, I think they're pretty. Uh, I've never shot one, so I can't tell you. But I, I think they look pretty uh, engraving-wise and the gold inlay and a lot of those characteristics. But, I, you know, I – and th- this goes against usually how I feel. But I do agree to a large extent that – the British take a lot of pride in the appearance and the quality of work and like they don't cut corners. Right. And that's why you get stuck with a big price tag is that they're not one to say, we'll skimp on this to be able to do this better. Uh, they're just, we'll do everything better to the best we can. Uh, and, and you're going to pay the price tag for it. So now, yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how obviously we were talking about in the last episode you were on, the, the British 12-gauge market has taken a massive hit in the last, what, five, ten years, you'd say? Yeah, probably the last three or four years, yeah. Uh, so. so would you say that, that now is the time to buy those guns? Do you think that the market's going to come back, or do you think it's going to stay where it is? Well, that's the, that's the question. <laughs> so I can tell you, I think the prices have come down on that stuff. So 12-gauge, 
uh, shotguns, you know, 12 gauge, I think all 12 gauge stuff, especially 12 gauge British stuff, the prices have come down. Now, I think they're probably going to come down more. And I don't know that, but the thing is, is I don't know who's going to buy that stuff in the future, you know, yeah. because the trend I think you're seeing towards the small bore stuff has a lot to do with what you're really seeing is a, a shift in how people shoot. And, uh, um, I don't know that that's going to change, you know, like uh, just how many, there just aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of American guys shooting side by side, 12 gauges. And, you know, that has a lot to do with the type of game people are shooting. And I think people just, there aren't as many people, uh, who need 12 gauges anymore. You know, you shoot twenties and stuff like that. And everyone's shooting over and unders. I don't think, you know, there's, I don't know if there's going to be a re- resurgence in demand for that, for this old side by sides and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, so you think it's still gonna fall? So now, why why aren't you uh, selling like crazy right now? Then, if you think it's gonna go down more, are are you planning on selling like crazy? Or well, I mean, I don't have I don't have a ton of stuff to sell, but um, but and the other thing too is I don't think you you um you don't really buy this stuff. It's not really. I mean, no matter what people tell you, it's not they're they're not investments, you know. No, um, not in most You try cases. to, you want them to maintain their value, but you're also going to enjoy them and use them. But if you're just looking at them for an investment, they're a, they're a lousy investment. All this stuff is, you know, if you, you're better off putting your money, you know, you know, <laughs> put your money in a, uh, you know, just put it in a mutual fund, put yeah. it in an index fund. You know, you don't have to, index funds don't break. You don't have to, you know, they don't rust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, my my brother made a killing on the fully automatics. That was where he made a fair amount of money. Uh, that that yeah, was that about, market. That yeah. market really took off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but okay. So now you're you go in and let's say what do you out of the major the high end? Let's call it the higher end. The Holland and Hollands, the Purdies, the Boss. Which is the one you can get in the cheapest? I think overall, like if, if in the used market, you can get into Holland and Holland. Holland and Holland tend to be uh, the least expensive of those three makers. Um, and I, that's just because they made a ton of them. And I don't know, they don't, you know, from a brand perfor- a brand point of view, they probably don't have as much cachet as Purdy's do and, and bosses do. And, and so the other thing too is so, uh, Holland made a ton of guns. Purdy made a ton of guns, but they probably didn't make as many as Holland. And then of those three, Boss made the fewest by far. So that's the other thing. There's just, there's not as many Bosses out there. Uh, so they tend to always, of, of the big London makers, they tend to bring the most money. So uh, I've been looking just, you know, out of my own curiosity, uh, are these Holland and Hollands in the sub $10,000 range worth anything? Or are they just kind of like just the crap Holland and Hollands that no one really wants. Because occasionally I'll see one come up for like eight or nine grand, and, you know, it's a whole new world to me, so I couldn't even tell you the first thing about them. But I just, I know the name, you know what I mean? It's hard not to know the name. But right. is, am I basically looking at crap in that price range? Well, it depends. So there's a lot of different grades of Holland and Hollands, too. Um, there are Holland and Holland Royals. There's Holland and Holland Model Deluxes. There's Holland and Holland number twos, which they, I think they also called those badminton for a while. So there's, there's a lot of different grades in there, you know? Yeah. So a Holland and Holland, a Holland and Holland Royal for under $10,000, I'd be very wary of. Um, just because it's probably got some issues, you know? Yep. Um, so you need to know what you're doing if you're going to start playing around with that stuff. You know, it's probably been it's probably been refinished, or there could be something else wrong with it. Because, like with the English stuff, especially, the more original it is, the more valuable it is. Um, so, if the prices are lower, there's probably a good reason for it. Um, but you know, you can find some of the other grades of the of the Hollands. You can find them, you know, for seven, eight, nine thousand dollars, and they're really good, solid guns. So, you you know it takes a little research into them to figure out if you're, if you know, if you're going to get a, if you're going to get a steal or if you're going to get robbed. Now, so. <laughs> when you get, uh, when you get barrels re-sleeved, is that a huge deal breaker for you? Yeah. Yeah. For me, absolutely. I, that stuff, it, you know, I think it has its place and there's a, there's a, there's a you know, purpose for doing it. But as far as buying stuff like that, I would never touch any, uh, anything sleeved. So, 
See, I find this all. Fat. It just doesn't hold its value very. That, that stuff tends to not hold its value very well. Yep. So. Um, okay, so now what? When we talk about Holland, Holland versus Purdy versus Boss, because those are the three big ones, right? Those are like the three kings of the market, so to speak, in British. Shockers. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, those are the best. No- those are the best known names. Okay. Um, what, and then Wood, Woodward's another big known name. Um, that's not. The, I mean, there's a lot of makers out there who made really great guns, but those are the. You know, everybody knows the name Purdy. You know, everybody knows that. So, um, can you break down the difference between those three major players? Yeah. There's, well, there's a lot of difference. A Holland and a Holland, a Holland and a Holland and a Purdy are very, very different guns. So, a Purdy's built on what's called a Beasley action. And it's a, uh, it's a unique um, self-opening side lock action that Purdy, I think it was 1880, they bought the patent from this guy named Frederick Beasley, and they've basically been making um, their shotguns and their double rifles on it ever since. And uh, it's a great action. It has a very distinct feel when you, when you use the gun, when you open and close it. So when you open it, it pops open um, because it's a self-opener. And then when you close it, it's, it's stiff, but it's very smooth. It has a very, um, it, it, has, it, just, it just has a, uh, I, find, I think they always feel very reassuring to me. It, you know, they, they resist you when you're closing them, but it's a very smooth, precise action when you bring the barrels up and the, everything pops together. Um, it, it just, it feels very well made. It's like a heavy door, you know, closing a heavy door. It takes a little momentum to get it going and then it, bang, it closes real easily. Um, that's the way purdies are. Hollands are uh, Hollands and bosses are very are more similar. They're uh, they're what's called uh, so how would I describe them? They're kind of they're called barrel cockers. So when the barrels drop, they have levers that tip the hammers up, and that's typical of a lot of guns. You know that's that's how they cock. So they kind of feel the same way. Yep. Um, bosses are a little different on the insides than a Holland. Um, Boss has their own proprietary ejector system. Um, Hollands are the Holland system is uh, the most copied system, side lock shotgun system in the world. All your Spanish guns, most of your Italian stuff, all your Belgian stuff, like a majority of the stuff out there is built on the Holland and Holland system. It's a copy of that. So it's a great, reliable, dependable system. Um, you know, arguably one of the best in the world, probably one of the best, the best in the world. And it's, from a manufacturing point of view, it's, it's easy to uh, duplicate. The Beasley action is a pain in the butt to build. That's why uh, very few other people have ever built them. Yep. Um, and the Boss system is a little different. I think uh, Hartman and Vice makes Boss style side by side. They also make Boss style over and unders. So there's little dif- there's little differences there that you know if you know what they are, they have little advantages, uh, but they're not huge. So. Okay, and. Now on the the smaller brands, let's call I I don't I hate using the word cheap because it sounds so negative. But on the the lower uh-huh. lower end companies, do you have a favorite that you like that you're like okay, it's not as well put together as a boss, let's say, but I really appreciate what they did for the price point. Well, I think all so all the British makers. Uh, would make they all had sort of what they called their best gun, their best quality gun. Yep. Um, and those guns tend to all be very nice. You know, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of makers out there. You know, there's William Powell, there's H.J. Hussey, uh, Churchill, um, geez, Charles Hellis. There's all these makers who made really good quality uh, side lock shotguns. And they also make good quality box lock shotguns. Um, and you really have to take them on a gun by gun basis, you know, because, um, some of them are some of them are fantastic, and you can find and and there were so many makers that you can find guns by obscure makers that are really well made. You know, um, it's it's really difficult to generalize about them. Uh, yeah, you know, because they they made they made so many different guns for so long that um, you know, the biggest thing about English stuff is, it, like you're saying, it, it requires a lot of study to learn about them. And then you have to go out and apply that knowledge to individual guns. It's not like um, you can't generalize about them in any way. So you'll always find something about them that changes your mind or 
you'll find something on a gun that you didn't think this maker ever did it that way, or there's there's always something peculiar about them. So, um, now we were we were talking yesterday. Uh, which was the company that had the the safety on the side? That was Greener. That's Greener, right? Is that that's yeah. that and that's a British concept right there with the the safety on the side. We were talking about all. The, yeah, that was Greener's. That was Greener's big thing. Yeah, the side safety. So I mean, the, the British seemed like they were very, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Innovative, maybe, in some of the things they tried yeah. before anybody else. So, can, like, do you have any of those things they did that maybe didn't work out, but were kind of neat or a cool idea or different that you can think about over the years? Where you're like, wow, that really was something completely unique. Well, there's all sorts of there are uh, all sorts of different designs. Um, so. Uh, hammerless so there were hammer shotguns you know like with shotguns that had the hammers exposed and you would cock the hammers yep um there were breech loading hammer guns so that's 18 1860s those come out yep and those replace muzzle loaders 1875 wesley richards comes out with a would they invent the box lock that's one of the first successful hammerless guns so the hammers move inside the guns. Obviously, the guns still have hammers, but you're, they cock differently. Yep. At that time period, from like the mid-1860s to the 1890s, there were all sorts of different inventions. You know, there were all sorts of things. People were trying to come up with different types of hammerless guns. They were cocking them differently. Um, they were putting the safeties in different places. They had different patents for different style ejectors. So there was a ton of innovation going on. Um, there were patents flying, you know, being uh, registered all the time. And the same, you know, same thing was going on in America, too. Um, and what you basically saw by the, by the 1900s or so, things pretty much shook out, you know. Um, the best stuff continued forward into the 20th century. And all sort of the, you know, the ideas that weren't that great got dropped and left behind. So you see a lot of stuff from, um, you see a lot of, uh, stuff from the 1870s and 1880s that sort of you can see makers like working out ideas um, you can see stuff that they they came up with and then you could see they you know eventually someone comes up with a better idea and everyone else stops doing it so an example of it is um, uh, Purdy on their hammer guns they had this little uh, they they came up with different ways of opening the gun so first there was a one of the first ways that open and close the gun was this thing called the Jones under lever, which is this big lever that sort of ratcheted out from underneath the trigger guard. Yep. And then they came up with this thing called the thumb guard. And it was this extension inside the um, trigger guard that you sort of pushed forward. And that was really awkward to use. Um, and then they basically uh, adapted a Wesley Richards top lever with this thing called the Purdy bolt. So all of these, these things kept changing and evolving. And they kept and eventually they sort of came up with um, the best ways to do it. So there is a lot of stuff out there that's sort of the uh, the precursors of these things. And I have I have owned some of that stuff, but I kind of gotten away from it. Like a lot of it, if you if you're really into oddities and eccentric stuff, there's a lot of that out there, and uh, it's definitely it's one of those collector's fields. I know people get into. All right. Well, anything else we're forgetting? in the, the British shotgun topic of conversation, any important things? We're uh, I think that, I think the biggest thing is that I think there's, you don't have to spend, I mean, so really good British guns are, you know, in my mind, like $12,000 and mm-hmm. up, but if for $12,000, uh, what it, I see, I see Parazzi's out there that cost more than that. You know, I, I, um, I know Krigo. I Krigo. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kriegos, I see Kriegos that cost more than that. Uh, and so you can get, you can get beautiful British guns for comparable money. And I think there's a perception out there that you can't, um, they're different guns for the most part. They're game guns. They're not, most of them weren't built to shoot a, you know, they weren't target guns, although they did build those types of guns. Yeah. Most of what you see out there is for game shooting now. Oh, that's, but, another, uh, that's another thing. But it's, it's, sorry, you reminded me of they're something. They're available. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, you know, one of the guns we shot yesterday was a, a pigeon gun, uh, which yep. to a lot of people is a weird concept of what the hell a pigeon gun is. So can you, can you get into that? Can you explain that a little bit? Um, cause you know, hunting in the UK. Yeah. So you, a, a tr- uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, so a true pigeon gun is a shotgun that was made 
for the sport of live pigeon shooting, specifically made for that sport. And live pigeon shooting, um, I don't know if you, it's a sport where they, it's basically was the precursor to trap. Mm -hmm. And they used to use, they used to use pigeons and that sport still exists. They don't, they shoot it and they shoot it in the U S they shoot it in Spain, Mexico. Uh, I think they, Mexico, they shoot it. They shoot it in some parts of the Caribbean. It's, it's highly, you know, they still shoot it, it. it's highly frowned upon in many, I got invited to a pigeon shoot and I didn't go. And it's one of my biggest regrets. Uh, but, but it is highly frowned upon in the U S uh, yeah, I, they shoot a lot of it in Texas. They yeah. shoot a lot of it in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, where they um, have the animal rights groups always protesting. Uh, but yes, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they used to shoot a ton of it in the UK, too, and they used to be a huge sport in the United States too. Yeah, um, they used to, you know, they used to have listings in the papers for top pigeon shooters. But anyway, these guys that shot that stuff, they had specific guns built to compete with. They so there's there were guns that were specifically built for pigeon shooting. And so what these, these guns are typically uh, heavier guns. They're usually like seven and a half pounds or so. Um, they have two and three quarter inch chambers. They're usually nitro proof for one and a quarter ounce loads. They're usually stocked pretty high and straight. They usually have uh, really wide flat ribs on them. Um, and when you pick them up, they tend to be... Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if there's a little more weight forward to them. Yeah. Uh, I think they tend to shoot a little high. They tend to shoot high too, because you're, you know, the pigeons for the most part, it's a rising bird. So um, you want a gun that shoots high rather than, you know, a gun that shoots low. Um, but it's definitely, it's, it's a specific class of British guns. And, you know, some people will, there's also heavy proofers, which were guns that were based a lot. Some of them were made to shoot waterfowl. Um, but there's there's some guns that people call pigeon guns, but they're not true pigeon guns. Uh, so that's sort of the distinction. True pigeon guns and true pigeon guns usually command a premium price too. I was going to ask that if they go for more or for less, because uh, it really is when it, pigeon shooting. Just really quickly, it is like one of the all time old school. I mean, that, that started the entire clay's world, so to speak. Uh, so mm-hmm. I was wondering if that like. You know, you, you see these British, like, game guns, and then you see the pigeon guns, and I always see the pigeon guns, like, in their own little area. And I always found it interesting because it's very specific people buy the pigeon guns. It's not a gun for everybody. So is it, like, a competitive market? Is the market small of the amount of guns available and the amount of people buying it is great, or is it just it's a lot of people and a lot of pigeon guns? No, there's not. I mean, there's definitely a small number that there's. You don't see a lot of true pigeon guns out there. A lot of the ones you'll see listed on dealer sites aren't true pigeon guns. Yeah. Um, but the 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 ones that were you know built for that sport are are hard to find. They tend to be um, uh, a lot of them were you know they might have they might have been made a little bit nicer than the regular guns. A lot of pigeon shooters were very very demanding clients. Yeah, um, because you know, they made a lot of money shooting pigeons. They were professional pigeon shooters. Yeah. And they were very demanding about what, how the guns were made, very specific about how the guns were choked, how they would pattern. Um, so a lot of times the gun, those guns, they can be a little nicer than your regular gun. Um, and they're definitely, I think because of that, they're, you know, they're very collectible. Uh, Cause they are, you know, they, they have a little, uh, the whole, the fact that they're a pigeon gun makes them kind of unique and special. So, and they're good for the other thing too is nowadays they're good for clay shooting yeah. because they're a heavier gun that you can, you know, it's built for, uh, you know, heavier shooting, heavier loads and stuff like that. Uh, so that's the other the reason why people like them nowadays. So yeah. just quickly for reference, can, what is the price difference between like a pigeon, the true pigeon gun and a non true pigeon gun of the same company? Like, I don't know, let's say boss, like a boss pigeon quality versus a non-pigeon quality of the same gun? Is there like a $10,000 difference? Is it a $50,000 difference? Yeah, it depends, depends on the gun. But I know, so there was a, uh, let's see, I, there was a true boss pigeon gun in Julia's, um, James Julia's auction, I don't know, maybe it was a year ago, two years ago. And I think that one, I think it went for 60000 But that was probably more than, that was probably more of a case of two guys who really wanted it. I mean, I wouldn't ever, I would, no one was expecting it for, to sell for that much. Yeah. And they were thinking it was more like a $45,000 gun, but, um, but it had, you know, two guys wanted it. 
Uh, it, it's, it's hard to say, like, because it's hard to find two. It's, it's hard to find two comps that you can put right next to each other. Yeah. Um, and say the game one goes for this much because the conditions and all those things come into play. Yeah. You know, like you can have a you can have a pigeon gun that isn't as good good a shape as a game gun, and the game gun would be worth more because of the condition. A lot of a lot of British stuff comes down to original condition, and the more a gun has, the more of it it has the more people will pay for it. You know, it's like, you know, cars. If you could find a, if you walk into a barn tomorrow and found a, you know, a 65 Ferrari that was untouched and been sitting there and no one had messed with it, it'd be worth a lot more than one that had been refinished and, rest- you know, if yeah. they just, people pay a ton of money for original condition. All right. Are we going to talk to you post uh, side by side? Southern side by side. Are you going to come back on after that? Give us. Yeah. Some- yeah. I'll talk to you. I'll, t- I'll be home Sunday night. We can talk next week. All right, yeah, I got uh, I got uh, Goslin coming on from uh, Upland Almanac, who's going to be there also. Uh, so, oh, cool! You Great. should you should track him down and be like, listen, we we've, we've been on the same podcast. Uh, welcome to the welcome to the club. Yeah, I'll have to talk to him. Uh, yeah, but it, I mean, you're just going down to look, right? You don't have the intention of buying anything. No, I'm just going to look and say hello to people, and um, you know, there's a lot of vendors there. There are people in there from the UK that I want to go meet and talk to, and people that I know that I haven't seen. So it's, it's, more, it's sort of like uh, it's a big convention more than anything else. You know, it's like a trade show. Are you driving? You, know? you just go. No, I'm flying down. Nice. Flying down. It's a Solid 12 choice. hour drive. So, yeah, well, I, I mean, they were packing up Robin hollow when I was there getting ready for it. Uh, oh so, yeah. Getting ready to go. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of fun. You know, it's just, a, it, it's a good place to, you know, and, and for my writing stuff, I'm always looking for stories. I'm always down there talking to talking to people, seeing what's going on, and uh, looking to do stuff to plug to my blog and stuff like that. So, uh, which we should mention, dogsanddoubles.com. I, I was plan so, I was planning on doing that my blog. on your exit here. <laughs> I realized I had, after I had introduced you, I was like, oh shit, I forgot that he's gonna yell at me later. And then I was like, oh, I'll just do it on the exit, and you beat me to it. Uh, no, but it's on my list of things. I I really next year I want to go to a lot of these conventions and like. You know the southern side by side and uh, pheasant fest and all that stuff. I want to uh, try to do as many as I can next year. Um, yeah, they're they're fun to go to. All right. So, uh, what, do you know, do we know what country of origin we're doing next next uh, time you're on? Jeez, we can talk about we can talk about German stuff. Ooh. Uh, all right. You sure? I know you're. Yeah. I know you're a little pissed about how they bombed all those uh, British factories still, but. Uh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> we'll talk about good german stuff the oh. stuff made before world war ii so. ouch ouch hey listen i saw you shoot that 28 <laughs> gauge and you lit up well you brought well you got the the simo pair with the 28 gauge you lit up like a roman candle you were ecstatic uh so that was all that was all shooter though yeah oh yeah yeah you you picked up that gun you said wow this is well balanced like i've been missing out on this uh, um, no but I, I i definitely i uh you know eventually we should do the italian stuff just to see you cringe uh, that's that's gonna be entertaining yeah no i mean yeah there's there's some italian stuff i really like there's some really cool italian stuff i just a lot of that boutique fancy beautifully engraved stuff just isn't my it isn't what i'd like and too gaudy uh, we could talk about that stuff. Is it too gaudy so, for you? It's it's a, it's a real. It's just not. Yeah, I mean, it's just not my thing. You know, I just don't like how it looks. Uh, it's they're very. It, it's a really interesting period uh, in gun making. What the Italians did is really cool. I mean, they really took. Uh, they took that whole art of gun making to a different place. Um, you know, those Italian guns are a lot different. Um, very unique in their own ways, and I, I think all that stuff's really cool. The guns themselves just don't appeal to me. They're too they're too pretty. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um so all right. Greg Elliott, dogs and doubles. Uh check him out. Uh you got the blog and you got the Facebook group, right? You got the Facebook group, blog. Yeah, I've got a page on Facebook. Yeah, I'm on Instagram too, and so check me out. Yeah. You haven't broken into the Twitter world yet. No. I do I have I you know, I have an account for my but I don't do it. It's just I've got enough social media stuff going on. It already gives me a headache. <laughs> yeah. So. You're checking your phone every five minutes. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, so anybody has. Yeah. Any, thanks a lot. It's great. Yeah. Anybody has any questions, British gun related? Should they just email you? Do you want to? Yeah. Just drop me an email. Check out my blog. Uh, drop me an email. If you got, if you have questions, if you got something you want to know about, if you want to buy stuff, just let me know. I'm happy to help you out. And, uh, 
you know, I know about all the, I've dealt with all the auctioneers and the, the major auctioneers in the U S and in the UK. And I know about importing stuff, exporting, I've done all that kind of stuff. So if you got any questions, let me know. All right. Awesome. Uh, excellent resource. I'm glad to have you as our first back, uh, double guest. Uh, first time ever uh, having somebody come on twice. Uh, it means you're more deranged than I thought, so I appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to talking to you after the, uh, the Southern Side by Side. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thanks. Darling, are you enjoying the good things in life? Like Masterpiece Pipe Tobacco. The five great pipe tobaccos of the world in one master blend. Virginia, Perique, Turkish, Latakia, Burley. Why am I so interested in pipe tobacco? Darling, because you are. All right, today we got our first time guest, uh, John Carney, Vice President of Sales for La Florida Minicana, coming from us in a car somewhere in Pennsylvania. How are you doing? Doing good, Andrew. I, I love how we were talking prior to this being uh, being live, essentially. And I'm sure people are wondering what we're laughing about, and we'll never be able to tell them, unfortunately. Uh, exactly, exactly. That's that's how I like to do it. It gets you, it gets everyone loose and uh, less serious in the interview because everyone else starts like talking random shit that they didn't have planned before. So now at least we've gotten the pleasantries out of the way off mic. I mean, I, if you can refer to what we were talking about as a pleasantry, that's that's uh, you know that's a different definition than I have. <laughs> is what it is. Hey, you miss me every time you go into twins, and I'm not there. Don't lie. <laughs> I, I I I miss you every time I come to New Hampshire. Sometimes it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> no, my friend, I'm uh, I'm glad to be on the podcast, and uh, it's been enjoyed watching you through the social media and what you've been doing with this and. Uh, Certainly miss you on the cigar smoking side, but it's good to be able to share uh, to share this moment together here. So, well, thank glad, you. Glad to be back. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, watching from a distance on a, a you know, reversing this, uh, LFD has certainly had uh, a hell of a year. Uh, you guys won Cigar of the Year uh, this past year, so you want you want to tell me about that a little bit? So yeah, um, Cigar Aficionado every year does a top twenty five cigar list. I've been at least fifteen. It might be longer than that. Um, but uh, every year they have a top 25 list. I would select the top performing cigars from the year from their rating system that they use uh, from their in magazine and their Cigar Insider, which is a bi-weekly, uh, uh, essentially, cigar newsletter that they have. Um, and we were very and humbled this year to, to be selected as number one right towards the end of 2016. It's always announced uh, now in December. Uh, so we got a nice surprise in the middle of December uh, that was selected as the top cigar of the year, which is which is also a kind of a blessing and a curse uh, at the same time. Uh, for example, for us, you know, the way our company operates, yeah. So yeah, so we handle our own uh, growing of the tobacco at our farm. We have our own production at the factory. It's owned by a husband and wife, uh, Lido and Inez Gomez. So we're we're actually kind of a small operation um, in relation to what the image of what our size. Uh, is on the outside, you know, where the appearance of what we are is that we're much bigger than what we are. So when uh, you select something as Cigar of the Year, this is really a, uh, something selected as Cigar of the Year, this is really a worldwide type, um, you know, recognition. Uh, so the, the brand image um, and the demand that's placed upon the product because of this rating um, is quite significant and definitely uh, puts a strain on production. Uh, so as I said, it's a blessing and a curse. It's certainly a great honor. Uh, it's been great for us to kick off 2017 uh, with the Andalusian Bowl being a Cigar of the Year, uh, but at the same time, it's taken some time for us uh, to to train new people at our factory to make the product, uh, as well as process the right amount of resources to be able to uh, increase the production um, and increase the supply based off of the extra demand because of the Cigar of the Year. But certainly an honor and a great way to kick off 2017. Yeah, well, the, the cigar itself is, it's what, uh, six and a half inches, right? And it's... Uh, six and a half by 64, and it's essentially uh, a short Solomon, for example. Solomon is, uh, is essentially a large figurato, um, and it's fat at one end and skinnier at the top, so it's about a 52 ring gauge at the top, and it works all the way down to a fat little 64 uh, at the end. And it's quite a large cigar, and it's got a lot of weight to it, too. So it's, it's a big, big product. It was actually the, the largest cigar that's ever been rated number one 
uh, by cigar aficionados. So uh, something that's that big uses a ton of tobacco as well. So it takes time to make the product. Um, and we're, we're slowly getting caught up and digging ourselves out of the hole that we were initially in uh, once the rating was announced. Um, and we're, we're slowly getting caught up with it. But, but one funny thing was, uh, this is my favorite part of, uh, I guess it's not necessarily my favorite, but a funny story from when it was announced is the, the, everyone always kind of assumes with cigar magazines or ratings or top 25 lists uh, that, that you're in bed with these people that are doing these ratings. Um, and that you know, they give you a heads up and that you're involved and you know far in advance um, that you're going to be doing this. I mean, we have no idea and we had no idea that we were even uh, even going to be on the list, let alone be number one. So when we found out that we were number one, we found out exactly at the same time that everybody else did at 10 o'clock uh, when Cigar Aficionado updated the website. There was no pre, uh, you know, pre-warning. There was no discussion about it before. Uh, they didn't disseminate any information to us. Uh, alerting us beforehand that we were going to be getting this rating. Uh, so it came as a complete surprise and a complete shock to us at the time. Um, and the funniest part of that whole situation was the day that it was announced was also the last day that our factory was open for the holiday season. <laughs> Traditionally, uh, in the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua, these factories close uh, for the Christmas season. They take two or three weeks off to let the people celebrate with their families. Uh, there's a strong religious uh, you know, culture down in these countries, um, especially in these areas. Um, so they our factory closed the very next day after this was announced. Um, so you get cigar of the year and you get this influx of demand, and, and you're and everybody's going on vacation essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is torture, and every year it happens. I mean, uh, what was that? I'm trying to remember when I was working. It was the the Millennia, uh, the Melania one, and they you couldn't get those things in every every time they do this. No one knows what's coming, and it's just an absolute nightmare because everyone wants to buy it and no one can get it. So. Uh, yeah, it's never fun. It is a curse. Uh, it's yeah, it, 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 when, when, you know, you mentioned Oliva, the Oliva Milano, really nice cigar. Um, you know, the Oliva Milano is a line of cigars. Uh, there's like eight different sizes in that line. Yeah. Now there's one specific size that got cigar of the year, yeah. but with the Andalusian bowl, it's, it's one size, one shape, one cigar. So it's not like there's even other sizes, uh, that you can try to help, you know, ease some of the, the demand on where it's like, oh, hey, we don't have this size, but if you want to try the line, you know, this cigar is very similar to, you know, the Oliva V. Milano uh, Robusto. There is no reserve, uh, there is uh, Andalusian uh, no Robusto. Yeah, that's, that's even unique in its own right, being that one size and one shape, uh, but that also creates its own its own set of challenges as well, but you know, it's definitely said, it's a challenge that we're, that we're, set, that we're set up for uh, it's something that we're we're super honored with, um, and we are catching up with the demand. Um, and I, I wouldn't change anything about it. Trust me, we're we're so honored by it. So let me ask you, what's the right occasion to smoke the bull? Like, is it a after dinner kind of cigar? Is it out you know uh, out and about town doing stuff? Like, when when's the right occasion to sit down and smoke the bull? Well, for for me, I've been smoking it since I, I don't want anybody to ever catch me smoking the Andalusian bull. Simply because I, I don't want anybody to sit there and be like, oh, the vice president of sales is smoking Andalusian bowls, but I can't find them. So <laughs> I, I very rarely smoke it. So for me, there's there's very few occasions that you would, that would ever catch me. I, I had one on my birthday in February. Uh, so for me, it's kind of been a celebratory cigar. Um, you know, it is at a little higher price points, around 15 to $16 MSRP. Um, so it's not necessarily an everyday cigar. Uh, but it, it, for me, it's something that's, you know, when I when I smoke it, when I saw it the first time in July, I'm like, this is something I'm going to smoke on a somewhat regular basis. You know, I'm going to smoke it once a week, one of these a week, um, and it's going to be something that I sit down and really enjoy in the moment when I have free time. And for me, when I have free time, it's usually in the evenings. Um, you know, at the end of the day, after we've been visiting retail stores, um, or if I'm at an event, at a special event, after the event's over, sitting down and relaxing. Uh, so for me, this is kind of the Andalusian Bowl for me. Is a is a nightcap type of cigar, a cigar that tops off the evening, uh, tops off a great day, tops off a great meal, um, you know. And to be a little trendy, I guess it's like the mic drop of cigars. When your day's done and you've had the best day ever, uh, you light up an Andalusian bowl and, and drop the lighter, and that's the, the last cigar to, that you would need to, to fulfill a perfect day, in my opinion. All right, so uh, we'll call that a, a post hunting cigar. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, you know, sporting clays a lot like golf. Uh, so usually those types of cigars go hand in hand. Uh, what are your, your golfing 
uh, we'll call it sporting clay cigars, where you're out walking around, you got to put it down, pick it back up, you're going out for a couple hours. Uh, what in the LFD line falls into that category? So the last time that I shot clay was uh, was a friend of mine his bachelor party weekend, and we all big ring gauge cigars. Yeah, I tend to when I'm outdoors doing any type of sporting event, whether it's golf, shooting. Uh, fishing to any any outdoor activity for me. I like something that's a little bit bigger. I like a little bigger ring gauge, something that's going to, uh, one, stay lit. The more surface area, the bigger ring gauge. Uh, ring gauge is essentially the surface area. In the of the cigar. Um, something that's going to be bigger is going to stay lit because you have more surface area burning. Yep. Um, also, it's going to be a little bit smoother. And you tend to have larger cigars tend to be built with a rugged premium tobacco. You know, it's going to be now, some of these larger cigars, you're not seeing them with Connecticut shade wrappers on it, which are real thin, light uh, tobacco. You're seeing them with thick, sun-grown tobaccos that uh, have been, um, you know, just have been really, really not protected, essentially, from the sunlight. And what that does is it creates a thicker tobacco. Now, in reverse, when you're outside doing some sort of sporting activity, if you have something that has a little bit thicker tobacco, it's going to have the same type of reaction that it would have when it was growing on a plant where it's going to be less susceptible to damage by the elements. So if you're outside, there's wind blowing or there's, you know, changes in humidity and whatnot, uh, thicker, stronger tobacco uh, is going to this time. So for me, I, I, uh, on that weekend where we were shooting, we were smoking uh, two different cigars, actually. Uh, we were smoking from our, our Reserve Especially Outline, which is a cigar uh, that's medium, medium full for us, uses a wrapper from Ecuador, uh, Dominican binder and filler that are grown on our farms. Uh, we were smoking that Reserve Especially Outline. Uh, the two that we had that were specifically were our Gran Robusto, which is a new cigar in that line for us. This Reserve Especial is actually our second line that came out in the uh, mid-'90s, and at that time it was a very mild cigar. It's a little fuller-bodied now. Uh, but the at that time, bigger ring gauges weren't super popular, so when we brought this brand back, uh, Reserve Especial, we brought it back in July, we actually added two sizes that were uh, – really conducive to being smoked in outdoor activities, essentially. Uh, one of them is our Gran Robusto, which is a five and three quarter inches by 60 ring gauge. And then we have one called the Super Corona, uh, which is a seven by 60. And the Corona size is generally 44 ring gauge to 46 ring gauge. Uh, but the Super Corona we have is seven inches by 60. So it's kind of a behemoth. Um, and then um, another large ring gauge offering that we have, uh, which is even bigger than the uh, Super Corona is our Digger which is from our Double E Hero line, which is super full-bodied, really rich, um, and a great cigar for golf and a great cigar for shooting, uh, simply because it's huge. It's 8.5 by 60, uh, 60 ring gauge, super thick tobaccos, and it burns forever. You can set it down for two holes and pick it up, and it's still going to smoke. One, one, of my, um, so one, of my best, one of my best cigar memories was uh, with you and a couple of our friends in Boston at uh, Stanza's. <laughs> And uh, yeah. you pulled out, I think it was like you bought five diggers, which it's like, you know, that's a time commitment. And it's a good cigar. You know, it's intimidating as, as shit. I mean, you look at it and it, it petrifies some people. Uh, but it, it isn't as knock you on your socks as you would expect when you look at it. Um, I think it's one of the more underrated cigars from you guys. Um, you know, people don't smoke them as much. For the price point and the amount of cigar you get, I think it's like a knockout uh, in quality and price point. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, for, it's around $11, and it, and it was when it first came out. It was one of the largest cigars in the market. It came out in 2009 and 10, and it was huge. There wasn't a lot of big ring gauges out there, and you see a lot of bigger cigars now in mainstream. Um, but uh, I 100% I agree with you, uh, only it, it's really not underrated because it is our second best-selling cigar, period, uh, in the entire world. Our number one is our Double Hero 700 Maduro, which is a 6.5 by 60 version of the Digger, essentially, and the Digger is 8.5 by 60. Um, but you just don't see, you don't just see in a cigar shop, you don't see as many people smoking the bigger ring gauges because the people that are hanging out in cigar shops a lot of the time are, you know, are into what's new or into like what's trendy. Um, and, and really the hardcore premium cigar smokers are the ones that are smoking these big ring gauges. Um, and those aren't necessarily the people who see them and they're buying them by the box, um, you know, or they're buying them by the handfuls to take them to go do their outdoor activities or go and do things that, that aren't necessarily just sitting in a cigar shop for three or four hours. Um, and you move a lot of those things, you know, so as I said, it's, it's our number two best selling skew. Um, so it does show 
that you know there is a huge demand for that. But you also mentioned too, it's it's not a butt kick. Yeah, I mean, I never would have guessed if you had told me before pick our two top selling cigars. I never would have guessed that that was number two. Uh, no, no, nobody ever does. Because you know, you know, I, we had our regular customers that always smoked them. I mean, you, you know, you know the one person I'm thinking of in particular who would smoke like three in a day. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we had those people who were dedicated to coming and buy a box uh, or whatever. But on a on a single sales stick, you didn't see a lot of them flying out the door uh, like some other stuff. But you know, everyone that, the the regulars loved a lot of those cigars. Uh, you know, the digger especially they they adored it. So, uh, but it is shocking. I never would have guessed that was number two. Yeah, number number two, number one's uh, the as I said, seven hundred Maduro. Uh, so the big ring gauges are still king, um, and it's a really niche market, you know. And it, it really goes in line with I, I think a lot of probably your listeners, you know. I think a lot of your listeners probably uh, whether you're a big ring gauge smoker or not, uh, you know. When I go golfing, I, I don't smoke a lot of big ring gauges, but when I go golfing, I smoke ring gauge. When I go shooting, I smoke big ring gauge. When I'm hunting, I smoke you know, bigger ring gauge. I want something that's going to last the whole day or it's going to last a while. So I'm not have to play around with it. And when I set it down, I know it's not going to get beat up. Um, you know, and there's, there's definitely a lot more smoking that happens in the outdoors and outside of cigar lounges than there, than there does inside. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the majority of smokers are people that are smoking, uh, doing other things. Yeah. You know, and the lounges are great. So it's a confined area where you're seeing people smoking. There's a great brotherhood and camaraderie there. Uh, but the reality is, you know, majority of cigars are smoked up. Now, uh, a quick question for a little backstory here. Uh, we, <laughs> you, along with myself and one other friend, uh, stumbled across a box of uh, uh, of factory press twos. I'm wondering how many do you still have left of the original box that we split? Uh, from the box that we split, was it just the three of us that ended up splitting them at that time? Yes, I mean Cope kept most of them, and then uh, okay. Uh, how many come in one of those cases? It's a hundred and twenty count crate, so this the new factory press will be the same packaging. Um, it's a big, it's a big box that actually is a a press in itself where the cigars are pressed in the box. Hence <laughs> the name box press. Yep. Um, or factory press. Uh, so it's a hundred and twenty count crate. And out of the factory press two that we all split, uh, I have I have eight of those left. <laughs> However, I have an entire box hidden Ooh. somewhere in the United States uh, that has my name on it. Just so I actually have my own box of factory press twos that I discovered and that are being hidden and are in safekeeping. It was so like- I, I right now have a hundred and twenty uh, factory press twos, nice which to- were uh, from two thousand seven. Yeah, I still have uh, two trays, uh, so I'm feeling good about myself. That was the best part about doing the inventory at Twins when we changed locations was all the LFD finds. Remember I found that box of the uh, the old school label uh, Lanceros? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was well, and, so many good finds. It, well, and, you know, the owner there, Kirk Kendall, he, he's been, one, he's a good you know good friend of mine. But he was also, before I, before I knew him, he was a huge cigar collector and, and slash uh, hoarder. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he, he always had some really rare stuff, and I was just digging around in the humidor a few weeks back. I mean, he's got some things from like 2001. He's got some boxes from 1997, and this is all the Florida Dominicana products. So it, he's got some really rare stuff, and it was it was always fun to dig around and see what see what was hidden around and and find gems like that. And I tell people whenever you have an opportunity to try something that's older, especially from a brand uh, that makes fuller bodied cigars. Yeah, uh, you know we make fuller bodied stuff, and you know other brands that are full bodied out there as well. Uh, but when you find something that's got some age on it, that was a really full bodied cigar back in the day when it was first created, uh, it's really fun to see how that ages and how it takes on different flavors over the time. Um, so I always suggest people: if you ever find something old, the older the better. T- try it, have it, enjoy it, and see how uh, see how it becomes you know something different than even what it was when it first came out. Um, especially if you had the chance to try it, you know, back in the day when it was originally these different lines or different cigars were released. But uh, a- aging cigars are great, and and, and trying to find, uh, you know, and stumbling upon different brands that are that are older are, are definitely something that's fun. Yeah, it's uh, it becomes addicting is the best way to put it when you start buying and collecting and sitting on and. But uh, yeah, Kurt Kurt always has something interesting hiding out somewhere. Uh, it's always yep. a fun time. So. Uh, anyways, I, I appreciate you uh, taking time. I know you're on the road. I know you're a busy man. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on doing this. 
Uh, and uh, trying to think, are you guys, so are you all caught up on the Bulls? Can I, like, is it going to be easy to find for most people? Or is it one of those things that's... No, the, the, the demand for it is still, still significantly higher than what we're supplying. Uh, there, it will be a little more readily available. Uh, you know, there may be a higher chance of finding them now than there were over the last few months. Uh, our production is essentially multiplied by a factor of 10 since, uh, since last month. We were training new rollers, so uh, those rollers are off training. They're now making those cigars. They're, they're perfect. We, we, you know, quality and consistency, making sure that cigar tastes the same every time that is what's important to us. So there may not be a, at a point, we may not get to a point where it's just always available, uh, but it is at a point now where uh, you will be able to find it if you're somewhat patient. Uh, and when you do find it, uh, you know, we ensure that that, that product is going to be the same for you and it's going to taste the same as it did. Uh, when that was rated 96 right against Cigar of the Year by Cigar Aficionado. But not, not caught up, and uh, we, we don't have any plans to get caught up. So it's more important for us to make sure it's the same every time than it is for us just to get it out to uh, to meet some supply. It's not about the money for us. Uh, it's about making sure that everybody has a great experience when they enjoy our cigars. So which that's is, the, same, uh, the same boat that we're taking down with which the uh, Andalusian Bowl. It is very appreciated because I remember working when a Cigar of the Year came out, and you could tell that they were shipped out quickly. And most of them, since it was a fragile roll, uh, you could tell that they weren't rolled properly and they were breaking when they showed up at the doorstep. So you'd open up a box and you'd have all the tips cracked on them, uh, which was no fun. So uh, that, that is appreciated in the cigar community, I assure you, that uh, you guys are making sure they're consistent. I'll let you go. Have fun at Cigar International. Uh, any other events coming up or is this it for you? Uh, I will be at, uh, I got a cigar guild that I'm doing tonight, so I'm doing a little cigar seminar. Uh, this evening in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I'll be with uh, Lito Gomez in uh, Philadelphia on uh, Thursday. He'll be there Thursday and Friday at Holtz yep. in uh, Philadelphia, great retail in the Philadelphia market. And then over the weekend, I will be uh, on Friday up in Niagara Falls uh, doing a uh, multi-vendor cigar festival at a casino up there in Niagara Falls in the U.S. side. And then on Saturday, if anybody that listens is in the Florida market, I will be in Fort Myers at the world-famous Cigar Bar at their downtown location. Uh, actually, I think it's probably Gulf Coast Town Center. Uh, but I'll be at a world-famous Cigar Bar on Saturday doing an event. And then Saturday will be a day off. Uh, sorry, Sunday will be a day off, and then we're back at it next week uh, up in the Northeast. So. Oh, man. Well, hopefully I'll see you in New Hampshire uh, one of these days. So, Andrew, thank you for having me on. Yep. And I appreciate, uh, obviously, I appreciate our friendship, but I also appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about cigars and whatnot. We, uh, we definitely will connect up soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks, John. All right, guys, uh, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, I want to thank John Carney from La Florida Manicana Cigars. Once again, check them out. Um, it's a cool brand. They're still... I don't know. It's this weird in between of being boutique and being a major player, which is really cool to see. Um, they make great cigars, awesome company. All the reps I love to death. They always were the best to me when I worked in the cigar industry. Um, can't speak highly enough about that that brand. And I'm not just saying that to blow up smoke up Carney's ass, but uh, but anyways, he's a good guy. Uh, the company is great. Uh, Lido, every time I met him, is awesome. Just fantastic cigars. Uh, moving on from that, uh, Greg Elliott, Dogs and Doubles. Um, it's like the Wikipedia of guns, uh, <laughs> shotguns for us. Uh, I, I highly recommend you check out his blog. Um, once again, awesome guy to reach out to. He's so helpful. Um, you know, he's the first one to tell you it's a terrible buy or it's a great buy. Uh, he's just always there to help. So I, uh, once again, I'm excited about that. Um, uh, next week, uh, John Gosling from Up and Almanac is coming on. Uh, he's scheduled to come on schedules are subject to change. Uh, but I think we have a, he's pretty good, uh, set time and place and all of that jazz. So I'm excited to have him on. That's a magazine that's been around for a while. Um, most of us recognize it and know it. And I just think it's going to be a cool thing to talk about because there hasn't been a lot of quote unquote literature side, um, uh, that we've covered here. Uh, beyond that, um, I do have a dog that's going off to boot camp uh, on Friday. All right, not Friday, uh, Sunday. I'm going down to Addyville again and uh, dropping her off with uh, somebody uh, who I'm hoping to have on. Uh, I don't want to ruin that surprise. Um, so uh, I think that will be uh, will be pretty cool. 
uh, little side story there with that. Um, so anyways, yeah, I mean, I, uh, like I said, I had a great weekend, uh, a lot of fun with those guys from mass. So, um, once again, thanks. Thanks for tuning in guys. If you can click and subscribe on iTunes and rate it and give me reviews, I'll really appreciate it. Uh, it's helping me out. We broke top hundred in outdoor podcast, which is awesome. Uh, I'd like to thank Australia again for, <laughs> for giving me that little extra boost, um, this past week. And uh, I will talk to you guys soon. And uh, thanks for joining us on Clays and Birds. I'm your host, Andrew Schatz, and this is where you take you from the range to the field. Have a good week. In the old English pointer, he once belonged to me. But I give him up when I moved to no fire. Oh.